بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Welcome to lesson number 12. In this video, we will go through a list of topics that may be relevant to the scenario we are dealing with. What I'm going to discuss in this video are general principles of these scenarios. You need to work with or consult your local scholar to see how these rulings apply in your particular case. Let's begin. Simultaneous deaths. This happens when two people die at the same time and it is hard to know or it is impossible to know who died first or the second. Now this scenario can come up when people die exactly at the same moment at the same time. This can also happen in cases of an accident or mass casualties where we are unable to tell who died first and who died second. So how do we go about calculating these shares if both A and B are an heir to each other and would inherit from each other. So the majority opinion is that we exclude both from each other's inheritance. This is taking into account the rule that a person would only inherit if they were alive at the time of the death of the deceased. So while calculating the inheritance of person A, we consider as if B is already dead. So B would not get any share from A. Similarly, when we calculate the inheritance for B, we consider as if A is already dead and we do not give him any share. Now, this is the majority opinion that is held by three of the four schools of jurisprudence in Islam. The second opinion says that we include both of the people in each other's inheritance. In this scenario, when we calculate the inheritance for A, we consider as if B is already alive at the time of death of A and the shares of B will go to the heirs of B. Similarly, when we calculate the inheritance of B, we consider as if A was alive at the time of death of B and the share that A was supposed to get will now be distributed amongst the live heirs of A. This opinion is held by one of the schools of Islamic laws of jurisprudence. Let's move on to the next topic, a lost person. So the last person would be the one whose whereabouts are not known and it is unknown if the person is still alive or dead. Now this person could be one of the heirs that can inherit from the deceased. So how do we go about this? So the rule says that we need to save the share of the lost person as long as one of the three things happen until the person is found so we give the share to that person. Or we find out that the lost person is actually dead and then we'll have to see if the death of the lost person was before the current deceased whose inheritance we are distributing or was it afterwards because that would determine if the lost person would have gotten a share or not. And lastly, in some cases if the lost person's whereabouts cannot be found for a long duration of time or there was a casualty in that area where that person was supposedly living, then the court can decide to declare the lost person dead. This is a decision of the local courts and the justice system. We cannot make that decision by ourselves. If this happens, then we consider the last date of contact with the lost person or the date when the person was lost as the date of death of that person. And distribute the shares accordingly. So how do we do this practically? We calculate the shares considering two scenarios. Scenario one as if the person was alive and scenario two is we calculate the shares as if the person has died. Then we look at the denominators of both calculations and make them a same denominator. Once we do that we reserve the share of the lost person and give the minimum amount from step one and step two to the other heirs. And then we just wait. We wait and reserve the share. If the lost person is found, we give the share to that person as per step one. And if the lost person is dead or declared dead, then we distribute the rest of the shares that were reserved as per step two. Let's solve a case for our practice. Aisha died in August 2019, leaving behind a daughter, a son, and one real brother. The son has been lost before Aisha's death, and it is not known if he is still alive or dead. 
So let's solve this scenario. We are solving the case of Aisha who died in August 2019 and we are just going to calculate the shares in which the property is going to be distributed. We write the list of relatives in the left column which is daughter, a son who is lost and one real brother. So we are going to calculate this in two scenarios. Scenario one, if the son is alive and scenario two, if the son is dead. So we begin with scenario one and since the son is alive, we will see that daughter will not get any share in table one and in table two, the son will get all the shares. Of course, the daughter will get her share from that share in two ratio one. So over here, the son gets two parts, the daughter gets one part, and the total shares are three. The real brother does not get anything since son is alive. In scenario two, we see that in table one, the daughter gets half as the son is not present. And in table two, the rest of the half goes to the real brother. And in this case, the son is not present. So the total for this calculation is four. We are dealing with two denominators now, three and four. The next step for us is to find common denominators for these two columns. For three and four, the LCM is 12. So we will transform our calculations using that as a denominator. One will become four and two will become eight for a total of 12. And in this column, it will be six and six for a total of 12. Now we can see that the son can potentially get eight shares. That's the maximum amount he can get. And we need to reserve this amount until we figure out if the son is found or actually dead or declared dead. So we reserve eight and the amount we can distribute right now will only be these four parts. So we distribute four now. We don't give anything to the son. Of course, his share is being reserved and we don't give anything to the brother until the case is sorted out. If the son was found dead before Aisha's death, then we distribute his aid by giving two more to the daughter and six to the real brother. And if the son is found alive, then all of this aid goes to the son. So this is how we do calculations for lost person. Moving on to an unborn baby. So the rule over here is that an unborn child will get a share in inheritance if the child was conceived before the death of the deceased. And this is very important. And there are rulings around that what is the minimum duration of conception so that we can figure and sort these things out if there's a dispute. So the child has to be conceived before the death of the deceased and the child has to be born alive to get a share. If the child is born dead, then the child does not get any share. And Prophet Muhammad has said in this hadith that no child inherits until he raises his voice or cries. And of course, it could be a he or a she. The meaning of the hadith being that the child has to show signs of life before they can inherit. Now, the unborn baby could be the child of the deceased, could be a grandchild, could be a sibling, or could be an extended aspa relative of the deceased. So therefore, we can clearly see the scenario might change a lot depending if the child was present or not. So how do we go about this? Well, we need to consider that there could be multiple possibilities. The child could be born dead, in which case the child would not inherit anything and the inheritance would go to the rest of the heirs. It could be a male baby, a female, could be multiple males, multiple females, or both males and females. We calculate the shares considering all these scenarios. So calculate the share as if the child was born dead, which means the child does not get any share. Calculate the share as if it is one female child, one male child, two or more females, and two or more males. Of course, some of these scenarios will give you similar calculations, but for completion's sake, I would recommend you calculate all these five scenarios and make it very evident and transparent for others to see what you're doing. Once you are done with the calculations, we need to reserve the maximum potential amount that the child may inherit. Whichever scenario gives the most amount to the child or the group of children, we hold that amount and we can distribute the rest. And then after the birth of the child, we will see which scenario actually happened and then redistribute the amount accordingly. Now, there is some difference of opinions that do we need to distribute the property now or do we wait for the child to be born to get distributed? The majority opinion is that you can distribute the 
remaining amount after you are reserving the maximum potential amount for the unborn child. But there is also an opinion that withhold the distribution for now until the child is born and then you distribute the whole property. Then we move on to the scenarios which make a person ineligible for inheritance. And these are three scenarios. A murderer of the deceased, homicide, a disbeliever, and an illegitimate child. I would highly recommend you to seek an opinion of a local scholar to understand how these general principles apply to your very specific scenario. So homicide. Prophet ﷺ has clearly said, Al-Qatilu la yadisu. The killer does not inherit. If someone kills anyone, you cannot inherit anything from that person. The next is difference of fate. And Rasulullah has said, لا يرث المسلم الكافر ولا يرث الكافر المسلم. A Muslim does not inherit from a kafir, and a kafir does not inherit from a Muslim. Now this becomes very easy to apply when we are dealing with Muslim majority countries and dealing with families that are majority Muslims, and there might be one or two people who are non-Muslims. And even in that case, you can use your bequest of up to one third to benefit any non-Muslim family member if you want to give them anything and inheritance. Now, how do we apply this in a society that is predominantly non-Muslim and there are only one or two Muslims in the whole family? This is why it is very important to consult your local scholars and understand how to apply these principles in your specific scenario. Last condition to make someone ineligible for inheritance would be if the child is illegitimate. Rasulullah has said, Man ahara amatan aw hurratan fawaladuhu waladu zina la yadithu wa la yurath. Whoever commits adultery with a slave or a free woman, then his child is illegitimate. He will not inherit nor will be inherited from. We also find a case in the time of Prophet where the man accused his wife and denied paternity of the child. The Prophet ﷺ gave the verdict of their separation and the child was regarded as belonging to the wife or the mother only. The rule here is that any child born without a wedlock will be regarded as the child of the mother only and he will not inherit from the father nor the father will inherit from the child. Now this includes all paternal relationships as well like paternal grandparents, siblings, uncles, aunts and cousins. It is important to know that if someone falsely denies paternity of a child, this is a major sin. Seek the opinion of the scholars to understand how to apply these rules in your own scenario. So if a man and a woman have a child, this child could be male or a female, the typical relations of this child would be maternal grandparents, paternal grandparents, then father's siblings, mother's siblings, paternal siblings, maternal siblings, or real siblings, and then the child's own children and a spouse. But in this case of a legitimate child, where child is born outside of a wedlock, then all the paternal relationships will be cancelled. And for the purpose of inheritance, only mother and the maternal relationships will be taken into account. The relationships of the children and the generations to come afterwards are unaffected. I highly recommend you to seek opinion of your local scholars to understand how to apply these rules in your scenario. Let's now move on to a special case of inheritance of an intersex person. An intersex person is the one whose sexual organs are not well developed. They may have features of male and female or they may lack features of either gender. There could be associated genetic defects that are present but the definitions are based on the development of sexual organs and the appearance of primary and secondary sexual characteristics. So how do we go about this calculation? We calculate the shares assuming that this person is of male gender. Then we calculate the shares assuming that this person is of female gender and then based on these calculations whichever is the lesser amount is given to the person. In terms of definition I want to clarify that intersex is a person who is born with ambiguous genitalia or ambiguous sexual organs. This is not the same as transsexual person. A transsexual person is the one who is born with a normal biological sex organs but they choose to identify themselves with a different gender. For the transsexual persons, the inheritance shares will be based on their biological sex. 
Last, we move on to dual relationships. An heir may have two relationships with the deceased, both of which could be eligible for inheritance. And in such a scenario, the person will inherit in both capacities. So they will inherit as relationship number one, and they will also inherit their share in relation number two, if that is applicable. So this scenario can happen if the husband is also the cousin of the deceased. The husband gets a share as a husband and then if the scenario goes on to extended asba, husband can also get a share in that capacity. Another time the scenario can happen when there is a maternal brother who is also a distant asba. Consider this woman married a man and had a child. Now her husband died and then she eventually married the brother of the husband and now they have more children. This person who is the child of the second marriage would also be a maternal sibling to the first child because they have common mother and also would be a distant asba because he is the son of father's real brother. This person will be eligible to inherit in both capacities if this person dies. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk.